the the, the challenge with a lot of these tools right now is um, we, we don't have a good understanding of what data is going to, um, or actually I'll, like, I'll unpack this a little bit more. So the reason why a lot of psychiatrists and people in the mental health profession find the idea of using AI so attractive is because if you go to a mental health provider, assuming that you're not in an inpatient facility, you're likely going to see them maybe for one hour a week. Maybe you can talk to them on the phone or like text them, whatever, but it's, it's relatively little contact. So the therapist or the mental health professional will just use psychiatrists as shorthand has like a very limited data set. And when you come to the, uh, you know, an outpatient meeting, for instance, you're relying on the patient's recall. How was your, how, how was your last week been? How have you been feeling, et cetera. And so there's, you know, surveys you can send out for momentary, like ecological assessments for, uh, for instance, um, to kind of get more in-situ uh, data. But the vast majority of the time that you are awake, uh, you have no data on that patient, how they're feeling, their behaviors, their thought patterns, et cetera. What's nice about AI is like we all walk around with a pretty sophisticated computer in our pocket right now, and we're just bleeding off all of this uh, digital exhaust all the time. And so the thinking around a lot of the kind of push for uh, AI and psychiatry is that we can use this data that we're generating because most of like most people are spending a significant amount of the time uh, every single day in front of a digital network device. And this data, even if it's not what am I writing into the computer? It might just be like my typing speed or my scrolling speed. And these things that are almost happening at a subconscious level might hold clues to my mental state and my mental health.